So first of all, uh, thank you all for taking the time to watch this. Uh, your time and feedback are very appreciated. Uh, and second, uh, just note that this is part of a bigger project that's in very early stages. Um, that's examining uh, various ways of evaluating, uh, especially from a social ontological perspective, um, our political strategies for social reform. Uh, and considering the relationship between social ontology and projects of social transformation, practical projects. Uh, in this talk, I'm going to be reconstructing some arguments from Rosa Luxemburg's Reform and Revolution that I think have uh, an interesting way of illuminating this topic. Um, and I'll focus especially on Chapter 7, which discusses uh, Edward Bernstein's uh, suggestions for using cooperatives and labor unions uh, as instruments of social transformation, reformist social transformation from within the capitalist system. Uh, and specifically, I'm gonna focus on some of Luxembourg's critiques of the role of cooperatives. So um, the outline of the talk is as follows. Um, I'm gonna start by talking about what Luxembourg has to say on cooperatives. Uh, and I'm going to talk about her views of progressive as opposed to regressive social change, which is going to play a key role. Uh, and then, then I'm going to talk about some of the more practical barriers uh, to cooperatives that she discusses and talk about how these two considerations relate to each other. Uh, following this, uh, I will take a look at newer theories of cooperative ownership and worker self-management and see how they uh, do and do not address uh, Luxembourg's arguments. Um, specifically, I'm going to look at ways they talk about breaking through some of the practical or material barriers um, that impede cooperatives uh, as instruments of social transformation. Uh, and then I'm going to talk about how there is yet to uh, be substantive work done addressing Luxembourg's conception of the difference between progressive and regressive social change and the limits of progressive potential. Uh, and I'm going to conclude by briefly kind of sketching out um, an alternative use of cooperatives uh, as part of a political strategy, um, if we are to accept uh, Luxembourg's argument or an argument quite similar to it. Um, so to start, Luxembourg st defines cooperatives as a hybrid form, uh, small units of socialized production within capitalist exchange. Um, and uh, so it's important to note that co cooperative enterprises uh, are being understood only as socialized food production, not exchange or um, consumption. Um, and also, uh, because they are small units of socialized production, uh, this process only changes a specific local market um, where the cooperative is located. So, you know, a cooperative food market in a town um, socializes uh, or partially socializes um, the process of food production um, in that town, right, not globally. Um, so the strategy, political strategy that Luxembourg is questioning is more or less as follows. Um, cooperatives are a way of doing away with commercial profit. Um, that is due to the appropriation and selling of products produced by a worker, by a capitalist, um, and this is juxtaposed against a different issue, uh, also of exploitation caused by the driving down of wages. Um, Bernstein suggests that labor unions are the solution to that, but we're gonna focus on cooperatives here. Um, and the idea is that by doing away with commercial profit, um, by uh, producing alternative um, enterprises with that produce the same product, you can put pressure on global capitalism, weakening its hold on the global market, uh, and eventually, uh, basically pressure all enterprises uh, to be cooperative uh, in this way. And so reform the dominant socioeconomic uh, system of capitalism from the inside. And this is what Luxembourg is questioning. So the first aspect of this argument is that she finds a conviction, contradiction immediately, right? If a cooperative exists within a wider system of capitalism, uh, members to function at, uh, in a capitalist and have to assume the role of both the worker and the capitalist. Um, and that means they either have to exploit themselves um, as capitalists do or be at a deficit um, in terms of their competitiveness in the market and risk failure. 
right? And so to avoid this, Luxembourg says that they must artificially remove themselves uh, from the influence of the laws of free competition, right? So um, basically she's suggesting that um, cooperatives have to manipulate the market in some way. Um, so her own suggestion is to pair cooperative producers with cooperative consumers um, and so guarantee a market share and avoid uh, kind of more general competition for that market share um, with other non-cooperative corporations or enterprises. Um, so you basically, you create a corresponding unit of socialized exchange alongside socialized production. Um, there are alternatives and I'm not gonna consider them here, but I wanna set them aside and have them in mind. We can talk about them in the Q and A. So you might provide government sponsored tax benefits or financial or market incentives to cooperatives um, that give them a natural leg up and help them avoid self-exploitation in that way. Um, and I won't actually return to this later, but it is an alternative. Um, and there are problems with that from a reformist standpoint, though maybe not a general standpoint. Um, and so Luxembourg considers this pairing method problematic. Um, and it's problematic because for a co-op, a consumption co-op to exist, it must be in a position to share the commodities uh, that they purchase in exchange. Um, and this places physical limits on their global reach, right? Um, especially when Luxembourg was um, talking about this, you know, you couldn't have a consumption cooperative that was globally distributed in a wide way. And so uh, they could only basically pair local production cooperatives with local consumption cooperatives and limits, that limits the global reach of the strategy. Second, there's a limit in their application. Um, there's only certain markets uh, that this strategy can be successful in according to Luxembourg. So for example, she thinks that um, the production of food and the production of certain local textiles, clothing, for example, might work in this way. Uh, but commercial transportation, mining, the petroleum industry, these more large scale global markets, um, it's harder to set up these pairings basically because the system is so global and so large uh, that is needed to both produce and exchange these products. Um, so what this does is to set up cooperatives to compete primarily with local businesses rather than global capitalism. And as Luxembourg puts it, puts it, it becomes an attack on the twigs of the capitalist tree rather than its trunk or roots. Um, and the implication of this strategically is that cooperatives will either fail to put pressure on global capitalism altogether, or they must push to kind of erase the global side, right? And go back to a more localized merchant strat style economy. Um, and neither is a happy conclusion. Um, especially as Luxembourg points out. So there are various components to this argument that I wanna take the time to separate. Um, first of all, there's theoretical issues related to regression and progression, right? So in the last slide, uh, one of the horns of the dilemma was a regression to mercantilism. And so that is being characterized in a certain way as problematic and that has to be discussed. And then there are the more general practical or socio-material, socio-economic conditions um, that are inhibiting the successful implementation of the strategy, right? So the, the lack of global reach is a material condition based on how people can in fact exchange and consume in these situations, um, which is inhibiting the global success of a cooperative strategy. Um, so first to talk about the theoretical issues, the idea of progress and regress, Luxembourg adopts a dialectical account of these notions. Um, loosely, this is what's meant by dialectical in this sense, so it's not gonna be terribly important. Uh, what constitutes dialectical movement is the coexistence of two contradictory sides, their conflict and their fusion into a new category. This fusion unfolds itself again into two new contradictory sides, so forth and so on. And this is uh, from Marx um, and it's the, method that Luxembourg generally adopts in this work in reform and uh, revolution. So progress then involves dialectical social movement through a process of fusion to some sort of new social organization, new social categorization. And regress involves changing back to a prior stage of dialectical development. So once you have this new fusion that's unfolded, 
uh, if the social transformation you enact takes you back to one of the contradictory sides that produce this fusion, you've regressed instead of progressed on this dialectical view. Um, but I want to set that aside. I don't want to rest too much on a dialectical social metaphysics. Um, so I'm going to set those aside and adopt these much less theoretically laden definitions uh, of regress as moving towards a past form of social organization with known flaws and progress as developing a new form of social organization that combines and builds on or further develops what worked in the past uh, into a new form of social organization. Uh, so for example, maybe being able to preserve the global reach of capitalism while avoiding uh, the problems of exploitation. That would be progressive um, because it builds on what worked, the global side gets rid of what didn't, the exploitative side. Um, so given all this, you can say that Luxembourg's argument employs this strategic condition, namely that one should not adopt political strategies that address problematic social conditions through means that produce social or regress. And so we have a condition on the kinds of social changes and political strategies that we should adopt. And it's a condition that's based upon normatively evaluating a social ontological distinction between kinds of social change. You can have social change that changes society in these ways, social change that changes society in these ways, and one, one kind of structural form of change is considered better than the other. Right? Um, and that's what this condition represents. Um, so as for the socioeconomic barriers, there are two kinds that uh, Luxembourg discusses. Uh, structural features uh, of the capitalist socioeconomic organization. So this issue of the contradiction of having to self-exploit as both capitalist and labor. And material limitations. Problems of global reach uh, and limited application, right? So things about the, the socioeconomic material conditions themselves just prevent a certain strategy from going uh, further or far enough towards social transformation. And both kinds are used in the argument, as we saw. Um, the competitive limitations of cooperatives are used to show that cooperatives require market manipulation. Um, and then these practical barriers, the material limitations are shown to show, are used to show that the various forms of market manipulation Luxembourg considers uh, produce regressive social change or no social change at all. Um, so this is the argument spelled out then. You have one, uh, in cooperatives, workers must play contradictory roles as both capitalists and labor. Two, to complete, compete on the global market, cooperatives must then either self-exploit or manipulate the market. Three, self-exploitation does not transform capitalist social organization. Four, the available forms of market manipulation limit cooperatives to local and smaller scale, less globally dependent forms of production. Five, this forces them to compete with local rather than global capital or replace the global market with mercantilism. Six, competing only with local markets will not transform capitalism. Seven, transforming society back into a mercantile system is regressive. Eight, one should not adopt regressive strategies. And C, the conclusion, cooperatives should not play a central role in political strategies aimed at socioeconomic transformation. Right. And so what I want to focus on and what follows and what I think is unique to this argument compared to contemporary discussions is the relationship between the second disjunct of five, the or replace the global market with mercantilism, and 782C. Um, and I think this is the novel move that Luxembourg makes. Um, and here's why. There's kind of two ways, given this argument, you might move. The first is that cooperatives need not lead to a regressive social organization. So you can challenge kind of the empirical premises. Or uh, you can argue that cooperatives can still play a useful role in political strategy despite their limitations. And I think um, this pushes the arguments about cooperatives in new and interesting directions. Um, so first we need to talk a little bit about that. and. Uh, Brussels 
2020 makes an interesting and useful categorization of most work on cooperative enterprises that is happening now between those that focus on issues of efficiency, concerns related to a cooperative's capacity to compete with non-cooperative enterprises, uh, and issues of normative concern. Um, so concerns related to the capacity of a cooperative to address the normative failings of capitalism, alienation, exploitation, et cetera. Okay. Um, so solutions related to efficiency do seem to directly engage with what Luxembourg was saying in that argument. Okay. So for example, premise two was that cooperatives uh, are at risk of being an efficient, at an efficiency deficit if they fail to either self-exploit or manipulate the market. That is an issue of efficiency. Can cooperatives both not self-exploit and compete on the market? Maybe economists can say something useful about this. Um, so contemporary economists might be able to address this part of Luxembourg's argument, right? Blocking the idea that cooperative strategies lead to social regress. Um, and so you can kind of see one way you might do this. So there's some outdated premises in it, for example. Um, technological advances in the internet and wider access to more efficient forms of transportation um, seem to alleviate some of Luxembourg's worries about the global scope of cooperative um, consumers, right? Um, so you have things like farm sharing and online marketplaces that create a lot more direct access between potential cooperative uh, producers and cooperative uh, consumers. But there's also less outdated aspects of her concern, right? So there hasn't been very much progress made in breaking into new spheres of enterprise in cooperatives, right? So uh, even these local or these expanded forms of um, cooperative pairings uh, are often mediated by things like Amazon Marketplace or Etsy or other um, very capitalist, very um, non-cooperative enterprises, right? Um, so while there has been some progress in addressing these material concerns, it's certainly not complete. Uh, and it's not clear yet, at least in this very limited exploration I'm doing here, that they can. Um, I'm not going to fully argue this point. I just want to show that that kind of work can integrate itself into a solution to some of uh, Luxembourg's concerns. But what's more important for our purposes is that the normative concerns that Luxembourg addresses or brings up are very distinctive. Right? So the concerns in contemporary literature on cooperatives focus on showing that enterprises do in fact have the capacity to alleviate normative cons normatively problematic consequences of capitalism like exploitation and alienation. And they argue over whether different forms of cooperative self-management or self-ownership can do so, right? So they might kind of bolster Luxembourg's claim that um, cooperatives can avoid self-exploitation and try to compete on the market in other ways. Um, but they don't address the broader concern that is this strategic problem, right? That you need to avoid um, approaches to social transformation that are regressive. So there are strategic normative concerns that Luxembourg brings up that are not addressed by simply showing that uh, cooperatives can in fact avoid the normative consequences, normatively problematic consequences of capitalism, right? Um, so what this means is that if one thinks efficiency concerns remain a threat to the potential of cooperatives to compete with global capitalism, then whatever their normative potential otherwise might be, they become strategically unsound if they can be shown to imply regressive consequences, right? And so unless we can block these practical concerns, um, there's this additional normative problem that uh, Luxembourg has shown us we have to deal with. Uh, so what are the implications of this? Um, if she's successful, uh, if cooperatives can't act as the primary means of social transformation, if they can't be ontologically transformative, can they play some other strategic role? Uh, and my answer is yes, but the role is epistemological rather than metaphysical or ontological. Cooperatives should be used as models to show potential participants in other forms of ontologically transformative political activity, how alternative social arrangements can work. They function as experiments of living as described in Anderson uh, 1991 and 2014. 
And uh, what they do is they show in these small scale examples that certain kinds of political transformation will have certain kinds of consequences, uh, positive consequences that people might be interested in pursuing. Right? And so this might be used as a wedge to encourage something revolutionary like a worker's revolution or something more reformist like the support of social policies that encourage or facilitate the transformation of economic enterprises into worker cooperatives, such as the thing I discussed before, uh, tax incentives and the like. Um, so that's my, my paper. Uh, thank you for taking the time to listen. Um, I'm excited to talk to you guys more about it. Um, and thank you very much.